one. So oh, we are live now. We can start our session. Over to you, sir. A very good evening, one and all. Welcome to this uh, GI master class on hepatic encephalopathy. Now, we have our esteemed guests, uh, esteemed faculty, and guests waiting for, with us since a long time. So we'll right away start up, uh, start with this webinar. May I hand over to this uh, this session to the moderator, Dr. VG Mohan Prasad, Chairman of VGM Hospital. Thanks, uh, Bamshi. And uh, you know my uh, gratitude to all those people who have joined us today, and uh, my greetings to the Salvat speakers. I'm sure we are in for a big treat today because we have three experts in the field of hepatic encephalopathy with us. Uh, of course, our uh, prime speaker today is uh, uh, none other than Professor Jasmohan Bajaj, from uh, you know, who's a professor of medicine, division of gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition at Virginia Commonwealth University and Central Virginia in the United States in Richmond. And he's a fellow of American Gastroenterological Association, American Association for the Study of Liver ACG, and he was an alumnus of uh, uh, our own uh, Maulana Azad Medical College, India active researcher and principal investigators for numerous trials and public with publications uh, in numerous. So he has published in Nature, Gastroenterology, Hepatology, AMJ Gastroenterology, Liver Transplantation, others, and he's an associate editor of the American Journal of Gastroenterology and Gut Microbiomes, Microbes, and he's on the editorial board of Journal of Hepatology and Hepatology and Liver Transplantation, a reviewer for many, many leading journals like uh, Nature, NHM, Annals of Internal Medicine, Nature Medicine, Gastroenterology, Cut, and Hepatology. So he's chairperson at the moment for the North American Consortium for the Study of End Stage Liver Disease and immediate past president of ESHIN, the International Society for Hepatic Encephalopathy and Nitrogen Metabolism. So he's, uh, uh, I think uh, those of you who have missed uh, his article published in uh, July 2020 as a lead author on uh, important unresolved questions in the management of hepatic encephalopathy has missed something really great. So he has answered so many questions. If you see hyperammonemia in a patient with cirrhosis, is it does it equate to hepatic encephalopathy or a confused guy with cirrhosis, underlying cirrhosis? Is it hepatic encephalopathy when it's even normal ammonia? A lot of challenges in clinical diagnosis. So translating uh, from bench to bedside is uh, what is the aim of this program today. And with us uh, on the, uh, you know, uh, as a speaker again, is Professor Dr. Darmesh Kapoor from Yashoda Hospitals from uh, Sikandarabad. He's a, uh, he's a uh, MDDM and MRCP and uh, he, he's got uh, lot of uh, publications and lot of lectures uh, pan india and also globally he has also co-authored the inasl guidelines on alf on uh, nutrition and chronic liver disease management of chronic hepatitis b and c and also contributed to a parcel guidelines on aclf management so and again another erudite scholar is uh, professor p n rao who's the uh, uh, director and chief of hepatology at AIG, Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, Gachibauli in Hyderabad. And, uh, you know, also incidentally, he is the ruling president of the Indian National Association for the Study of Liver. A scholarly person, and he's also uh, been very active and a great human being, founder and uh, secretary of INASL AP chapter, regional coordinator for AP in Telangana and a member of INASL task forces for NAFLD, HPV, HCC, contributed to INASL clinical practice guidelines, and also uh, he's uh, contributed chapters in multiple textbooks and also an honorary visiting teaching faculty at National Institute of Nutrition. And what's more interesting is he has been the best outgoing student of Curtin Medical College and also got his DM degree from uh, Chandigarh. So without wasting much of your time, so let me just uh, invite Professor P. N. Rao to speak as a curtain riser on this uh, interesting, uh, intriguing topic of hepatic encephalopathy uh, to get the whole process started. He'll be followed by Professor Jasmohan Bajaj and then Professor Dharmesh Kapoor for uh, uh, the other uh, talks. So uh, over to Professor P. N. Rao for his curtain riser talk. 
Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Vijayam. And then it's been a pleasure to be with you and to be with Dr. Jasmine Bajaj and Dharmesh Kapoor. Uh, let me share my slides. Are you able to see my slides, please? Uh, yes, sir. Can you go to the full screen mode? And also yes, yes. That's right. OK. Height, you can uh, height that. Uh, Yes, yes, I am doing that one. Thank you very much. And as you know that I am the curtain raiser for these uh, two topics, you know, the important topics today. And uh, I was just going, who is a, what is a curtain raiser? You know, that's, uh, I took this a short preliminary to the main event. And, and if you go back to the history, it was way back in, as you can see, this uh, hypocrite, you know, he has an association between the jaundice and the acute behavioral disturbance. And it was in Mor Morgagni who found out that in a patient, you know, who was uh, a well-to-do patient who has been an alcoholic. And uh, he started behaving abnormally. And uh, at, that, at this autopsy done in those days, 1682 to 1771, and uh, it, there was a cirrhosis of liver, and then that's a morgagni cirrhosis. Later, in 1893, uh, then it's shown that the dogs which are undergoing the experimental portal evolution developed behavioral changes within about 10 to 40 days after the surgery, and this was called a meat intoxication syndrome. If you look at this one, this is the left-hand side, you got the publication in 1997, that is 120th anniversary of the first vascular anastomosis. The X fistula goes by this scientist from Russia, is an X, and uh, created a portocavulsion. This not only, this is paved way for the treatment of the portal hypertension, but also, and then is gone into the immortalized by X fistula. This is the first primitive vascular anastomosis, you know, in those days, at that, that particular time, you know. And this is what is there, the, the portal vein and uh, the, how the encephalopathy is there. I will not go into the detail. But the first published work, in 1893 by Pavlov, and that's the reason why Eck and then Pavlov, they go together, but it was Eck, you know, who has created this in 1879, that's called an X fistula, and the first published work by the Pavlov was in 1893, and that's where this meat intoxication syndrome, you know, which you are seeing here. Later, of course, the relation to the ammonia to induce coma are super in patients of the cirrhosis. The datelines are there for you to see. Uh, it was in 54 that Sheila Sherlock, you know, then uh, defined the hepatic encephalopathy. But at that time, she coined the term as a portal sportosystemic encephalopathy. The name encephalopathy came later, of course, the latent encephalopathy, then the, the MHE, that minimal hepatic encephalopathy. And we are going to discuss two aspects today. One is what is the exact clinical role of an ammonia? Uh, we, we keep doing ammonia in patients with the cirrhosis, with the either altered or unaltered, or as a baseline workup. What exactly is the role? It is a contentious issue still. There are a lot many pros and then cons are there. And uh, look at this, uh, this one of the articles which was done in Ong in 2003 at that time, although they said that ammonia levels correlate with the severity of the hepatic encephalopathy and when a sampling is adequate, sometimes we think whether an arterial sample or um, venous sample to be taken, but only 31% of the patients with the chronic liver disease and with no evidence of hepatic encephalopathy had a normal ammonia levels. And also, there was a considerable overlap in the levels of ammonia, uh, which was more evident among patients with the grade 2 and then grade 0 to 2 encephalopathy in this particular study. And you see this one, just say no to ammonia, you know, one of the things, you know, one of the persons who has talked about in 2005. And this is the JAMA diagnostic test interpretation, you know, they go on to the test, you know, they give a uh, summary about how to assess uh, certain tests. The ceremonia level is not intended, not useful for the evaluation of the screening of the hepatic encephalopathy. But on the other hand, in acute liver failure, it's, it's been found to be useful. And uh, this is an interesting one, that is TWD-FNR, things we do for no reason, you know, this one. 
and uh, the Akarnet disclaimer also right on the top you can see that it is meant as a starting place for a research and then active discussions and uh, say that the HE is a diagnosis of exclusion and is made on the clinical grounds. They even go to the extent of saying that do not check serum ammonia levels in patients with the CLD to diagnose hepatic encephalopathy or to assess the severity of hepatic encephalopathy or to determine whether HE is resolving. I'm just mentioning, giving you the, the both sides of the, the uh, whether we have to do the ammonia and chronic liver disease. What we are going to speak is about the chronic uh, liver disease, cirrhosis, not about in acute liver failure. And this is another one, which is a retrospective study, of course, their intention to be whether the uh, lactose amount given, whether it depends upon whether encephalopathy is there or not. That's, of course, a very small study. And Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor, who has been introduced just now, he is going to talk about the clinical relevance of the day-to-day -day clinical relevance in serial ammonia measurements, uh, including, of course, the chronic liver disease here. And uh, we know that the catastrophic events of the chronic hepatic encephalopathy uh, just for the sake of discussion for the future, you know, we all know that the A, B, C of uh, hepatic encephalopathy. Someone raised a point, you know, what do you call if uh, is an acute and chronic liver failure, which is, as you know, that the hot topic of discussion, the guidelines are different, you know, Americans and the easel, apazil, we all know about that one. Then in a patient, in patients with acute and chronic liver failure, if there is hepatic encephalopathy, what would you call it? Where will you put this one? And they mentioned somebody raised a point that it could be type D, but uh, it's not a, uh, it's not that it is to you. Um, then um, I thought you know, I would mention it. Then someone said, you know, why we are discussing about the Italian guidelines? You know that, you know, some of these, we have got the guide, ASLD guidelines, easel guidelines are there, Apazel guidelines are there. But one of the things which uh, I thought I would mention for the sake of a purely for the discussion, because this is one thing which has uh, used some kind of a semi-objective of uh, um, how to go about and then grading. And they said that animal naming test that is called ANT. And they perform the animal naming test. I will not go into the detail just to show the slides here. First thing is you have to go to the animal naming test. Then the orientation of the time is also some kind of a, a semi-objective measurements. Then orientation to space. And then we know that the Glasgow Coma Scale is there. And the West Haven um, criteria from grade 1 to grade 4. And what has been done is that for uh, arriving at a final grading, they took the help of a combination of the West Haven criteria uh, made it into some kind of a semi-objective about the orientation to the space and uh, uh, time and the presence and absence of the flapping tremors and GCS and all these things they put into one kind of a grading. This is only purely for purpose of discussion and then points you know, which we are going to have it uh, during the discussion time. And then the next topic which we are going to discuss today is about the recurrent hepatic encephalopathy. Why should we discuss about the recurrent hepatic encephalopathy? Is that 40% within first year after the index hepatic encephalopathy they recur. And also it is a repeated hospital administration, cost and morbidity, and then associated with the, each of these episodes. And for this, as already been introduced, and none other than Dr. Jasmohan Bajad, whom you can see in these thumbnails that the uh, now the current topic, hot topic of his research and also current topic which we are uh, going to do, how to, st how to uh, stop the recurrence, you know, in that one, the fecal mi microbiota studies from Dr. Jasmon Bajad and also the the validation of the encephalopathy by the smartphone-based stroop test. Of course, it's not very popular in our country. And uh, with this, I thank you very much. And then uh, now I will... Uh, I request Dr. Jasmin Bajaz to have, go on with this discussion, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. Um, I'm hoping you can hear me. Uh, I just wanted to invite Prof. Jasmin Bajaj to speak on the prognosis and management of uh, recurrent acute encephalopathy. So over to you, sir. OK, can you see my slides? Uh, yes, very well. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you so much for this exciting uh, lecture about uh, lecture series on um, hepatic encephalopathy. 
And uh, thank you again for this wonderful introduction, which kind of sets the stage for all these talks. So I am going to focus on a very important problem, which is the recurrence of hepatic encephalopathy, and especially for prognosis and management of this very important condition. So what is the definition of encephalopathy? You already heard from Dr. Uh, Rao, but this really, the important, two important things is you don't need uh, liver disease to actually have this. If you just have portosystemic shunting, it's, it's, it's quite possible to have it. But again, you could have neurological and psychiatric abnormalities, which he uh, pointed out, covert hepatic encephalopathy or minimal HE, going all the way through coma. And the pathophysiology, we touched briefly, uh, he touched briefly on the microbiota, but it's the way we talk about hepatic encephalopathy, you know, we think about only two organs, the liver and the brain. But it really takes a village to cause someone to get hepatic encephalopathy. So obviously the liver is damaged. When the liver is damaged, it causes uh, the bile flow to be reduced to the intestine. The bile flow reduction causes the gut to go rogue. In addition to that, there's an impaired intestinal barrier. The gut microbiota that are still there make actually uh, products that are not really beneficial to the body. There's higher ammonia, there's higher indoles, there's higher endotoxin, which is lipopolysaccharide produced by gram-negative rods, and a lot more inflammatory cytokines. There's also changes in the local immune system, which allows these bugs not only to produce and reproduce, but also to make all these uh, uh, metabolites that go either through the intestinal barrier uh, to the, uh, the portal vein, or they can go directly into the systemic circulation uh, via the lymphatics. This then shunts through the liver, and some of this without um, leaving the liver, it actually goes directly to the brain, because as we know, these, some of these patients have portosystemic shunts. When they, the portion that encounters the liver has, shows a liver that is actually already pretty damaged because of cirrhosis, so it causes two more things. It actually, uh, the ammonia load cannot be handled, and that leads to hyperammonemia, and the bacterial DNA that is encountered through this makes the liver even more inflamed because a cirrhotic liver or a more advanced um, you know, liver disease uh, patients, uh, the liver is uh, very sensitized to bacterial DNA. And the more bacterial DNA you have, the worse off the situation gets. So the gut liver axis is completely um, you know, uh, impaired in patients with hepatic encephalopathy. In addition, people have problems with ammonia production in those who have uh, with their kidneys become net ammonia producers with reduced excretion. So instead of being a net ammonia secretors, the kidneys also add to the ammonia load, as well as the muscle. The skeletal muscle is quantitatively and qualitatively damaged in patients with cirrhosis. So therefore, the ability of the muscle to actually make glutamine and suck up the ammonia that is circulating also goes down. Ultimately, it affects the, the brain in multiple uh, ways. It affects the astrocytes, the microglia, and ultimately the neurons. Astrocytes are the nurturers of the uh, neurons. Microglia are the uh, macrophages of the central nervous system, which pick up inflammation that goes across the blood-brain barrier. Astrocytes swell up when you have uh, ammonia that goes away, uh, goes into the circulation, uh, into the blood-brain barrier. And ultimately, for actually things to manifest, the neurons have to be dysfunctional or damaged, as the encephalopathy considered <laughs> is um, considered to be a full syndrome. So you can appreciate here. It's not just the liver and not just the brain together. It is a whole lot of almost all systems of the body conspiring to make someone to get hepatic encephalopathy. And this is the four axes of hepatic encephalopathy according to the EASL and ASLD hepatic encephalopathy guidelines. And ideally what you want is when a patient with overt hepatic encephalopathy is admitted to the hospital, you actually put one from each of these axes together. So it gives you an overall view of not only what is happening to the patient right now, but also what happened six months ago, and therefore what might happen six months from now. So if you actually combine type, grade, time course, and presence of precipitating factors, you already have a jump ahead to predicting what might happen to these patients. So as Dr. Rao clearly pointed out, the type is A, B, and C. We are only going to talk about cirrhosis because acute liver failure is very rare, thankfully, and even rarer is the bypass, which is shunt without cirrhosis. The grade he also very nicely mentioned, covert is minimal and grade one together. Why do we need to combine these two? Because no one knows what grade one actually is. And especially when you talk about multiple examiners and uh, multi-center studies, it becomes very difficult to actually define what is grade one versus grade two, three, and four. Grade two, three, and four is very easy to uh, define clinically. Grade two is disorientation. 
uh, grade three is lethargy and super, and grade four is coma. So when you talk about examining in the patient, multiple uh, reviewers or multiple examiners will come up to largely the same conclusion, whether it's two, three, and four, but not whether it's minimal or grade one. So anyway, we are talking about hospitalized patients or patients who have a clear-cut overt hepatic encephalopathy episode. So the topic of my talk today is reliant on the time course. Episodic, which means this is the first FG episode in six months, or really their first FG episode ever. Recurrent, which is further episodes within six months. This is where our alarm bells should start ringing. The recurrent hepatic encephalopathy episodes are typically a gift that keeps on giving unless we break the cycle. If we cannot break the cycle, this patient unfortunately is doomed to go into the revolving door of admissions, readmissions, admissions, readmissions, and ultimately at some point they'll either fall, they'll fall off the transplant list, they'll get an infection, they have aspiration pneumonia, or something that could have been potentially prevented will happen. Last but not the least is presence of the precipitating factor. And this is also important for recurrence because if the precipitating factor is not fixed, this is actually something that is going to recur again and again. Spontaneous, it's very rare that you really do not find the precipitating factor. So it is something that is almost always found and we should really be taken care of. So ultimately, if someone comes into the hospital confused and, can, and this is their multiple admissions, you should really be put in the chart. This is type C, grade three, depending on of course what the stage of the patient is. Recurrent hepatic encephalopathy with X, Y, Z precipitating factor. So for example, we had a patient who came in with confusion. He had UTI and the UTI was with E. coli. And we did the, this is the first episode of AHE. And therefore we cultured his urine. The urine had E. coli that was sensitive to almost everything. We gave him an oral antibiotic and he was discharged. He was on the transplant list, uh, so, but we were not very worried about the UTI because it got fixed very quickly. Then he came back again. This time he had an infection which was resistant to uh, E. coli. The E. coli now was resistant to the Cipro that we had given him first. Now we missed the boat. I think we missed the boat at that point because someone should have actually figured out why is this person getting recurrent UTIs that lead him to get encephalopathy. And we know it is the same precipitating factor. So if you have two HE episodes with the same precipitating factor, you ideally should go and look why this person has the precipitating factor and why this person is going back again and again and again. Therefore, but we still treated him with an oral antibiotic augmentin or whatever, and then he got better. The third time when he came in, as you would expect, now he had a UTI, but it was a fungus. Then an alarm bell started ringing hugely because he was delisted temporarily until the fungus was completely extricated. And finally, someone thought of doing a cross-sectional imaging, which found a large struvite calculus blocking his right kidney. So this is something that potentially we could have prevented in the second a UTI. When this person got a recurrent UTI, you need to dig in deeper because these have consequences. Thankfully, the urine was cleared, the fungus was cleared, the infectious disease group gave the okay to be transplanted, and this guy and ultimately did get transplanted. But it took at least six weeks off of his transplant status. So these simple, simple things can actually create a big problem to your patients and can potentially get them off the transplant list and actually be lethal. So you really have to be very careful when you actually see whether someone has recurrence and it's the same precipitating factor, you need to go to the source of the precipitating factor because as we know, hepatic encephalopathy is a symptom of something else going wrong in the patient. And until there's something else going wrong is actually fixed, the encephalopathy will keep on going. <clears throat> so what is the burden of cirrhosis and encephalopathy? At least in the United States, it is increasing and increasing dramatically because people are getting older, they're getting, uh, they have more comorbid conditions and varicell bleed occurrences are decreasing. So therefore you have older patients with more comorbid conditions who are much prone to infections, acute kidney injury because of chronic uh, kidney disease ultimately, as well as have uh, multiple comorbidities of uh, cardiovascular as well as diabetes. Uh, therefore, they have a lot more prone, uh, they are not more prone to infections. And those infections are much more likely to lead to confusion because of all these other risk factors I told you. What is the readmission rate in this study from Naxal that has been reproduced multiple times? You can actually see out of more than 1300 patients, the number one reason for readmission was hepatic encephalopathy. 
But look at number two and number three. Number two was renal and metabolic, which we all know are potential precipitants of HE. And number three was also infection. As I told you, this is very likely the, the situation that we find in most, at least in most Western countries, that you have a lot more encephalopathy and a lot more of the precipitants of encephalopathy and a lot lower GI bleed as the cause of readmission than it was even five to 10 years ago. And what, why are these patients disadvantaged? These patients are disadvantaged, at least you know, that the MELS score does not have hepatic encephalopathy anymore. So it never had it, MELS score, because this child score was used in the past, but it never happened. Right now, these patients could have a very low MELS score and have this revolving door of multiple readmissions. So the only thing that can actually fix them is us. We need to do something to actually prevent this, because if you were, say, supposed to add cognitive dysfunction, or here they use the critical flicker frequencies, uh, frequency, and they found that encephalopathy, if you add the critical flicker frequency cognitive dysfunction, the survival is similar to seven extra points to the biological MELS score. But who does the critical flicker frequency? And does your transplantic agency actually take your word for it? And that is not going to happen. And therefore, a prior episode of hepatic encephalopathy in the Southern NICE study done in Italy and Canada also confirmed the same thing, that the MELS score is severely disadvantaging these people. The problem is in the operationalization of these patients with encephalopathy into the biological MELS score. So what we need to do now is to take care of these patients because by and large, most of them are not going to be liver transplant candidates. And this MELD purgatory that they actually are in, which is low MELD score, but a significantly uh, disproportionate burden of illness is going to haunt them until we do something for them. So we know about the acute episode and prevention of recurrence. These are the episodes that we need to, these are the things that we need to figure out in overt hepatic encephalopathy. So what are the treatment goals? In acute encephalopathy, as I've talked about, we need to treat the precipitating factors. And we need to actually note those precipitating factors in context of what happened before. We also mean to make sure that the patient's mental status is improved. And of course, since this is hepatic encephalopathy, evaluate them for liver transplant. Episodic encephalopathy is an outpatient. You actually want to improve daily functioning, prevent the recurrent episodes, which is the focus of this talk, and evaluate for liver transplantation. Again, these are all critical things I am not going to uh, talk a lot about the, in fact, I'm not talking about the acute AG episode at all. Suffice it to say, where we mostly drop the ball is the transition from the acute episode to the outpatient. This is where a lot of the potentially correctable things that are almost always nothing to do with medical, they're almost always logistical issues. The patient does not have a prescription. The patient's caregivers have no idea what encephalopathy is. The patient himself or herself has no idea what encephalopathy is. They're continuing to drink, et cetera, et cetera. These are not usual things that liver specialists deal with, but these are things that we really have far reaching consequences for these patients. So I'm not going to talk about the encephalopathy episodes and I'm of course not going to talk about the ammonia levels because I'm sure there's, I mean, there is an exciting talk by Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor after this. So how do you prevent recurrence? So patient came to you in the hospital. You did your due diligence. You actually assigned them. This is cirrhosis. This was the grade of encephalopathy. This is a potentially recurrent or the first episode. And X, Y, Z is the precipitating factors. You've lined all of them up and you're actually now ready to discharge the patient. So these are the checklists, which I think are very important. Does the patient know the change in their prognosis and daily function? especially if this is their first episode of hepatic encephalopathy, you have to realize, put yourself in the patient's shoes. Their entire world has now changed and will never go back to what it was before. They are now potentially at risk of being a burden to other people, and they are not safe to drive. They are not safe to do a lot of the things that they were, so, uh, were used to doing before. This loss of control, especially in older men, can be a big, big problem. And dependence on others is something that people are not used to. This is something that you really want to actually tell the patients and their family members. Does the patient and the family know signs of recurrence and ways to get in touch? This is very important because as you know, when someone gets confused, the only person who doesn't know they're confused is the patient themselves. So the family really needs to know, family or whoever is with the patient needs to know. And they are your eyes and ears to actually get in touch with you before the patient becomes comatose. Okay. Do they have a scheduled appointment for follow-up either with you or someone else? Make sure they actually have an appointment in their hand and not a phone number and not an uh, email address for them to actually do this. 
do they actually have medications to prevent HE recurrence with instructions in hand? This is a very important thing. At least in the United States, where rifaximin is very expensive, we often give the patient a prescription. Either their, in, their uh, insurance doesn't cover it, or they just do not make it to the pharmacy in time. And within one week, around 20% are back in the hospital for encephalopathy. Again, I've told this again and again, have potential recurring precipitating factors been investigated? And if they have not, you really must take a step back and not focus on just this episode, but put this episode into the larger context of what has happened with these patients. And last, again, but not the least, are they candidates for liver transplant? This is clearly the only lasting cure for people who come in for multiple episodes of encephalopathy, um, and you need to figure that out. So what are the medications for prevention of hepatic encephalopathy after discharge? This nice study done from India randomized patients into placebo or lactulose in this after the first episode of overt hepatic encephalopathy. And this is almost 11 years old now. It's actually 11 years old now, but it has kind of stood the test of time. This is the probability of encephalopathy on the y-axis. On the x-axis is follow-up in months. And you can see, obviously, this is a randomized trial, but it was an open-label trial because it's very difficult to randomize placebo uh, lactulose. So you have lactulose in 61 people, and 64 people got placebo. And you can see there was a clear-cut reduction in lactulose. But lactulose comes with a big, big price. Even though it is much cheaper than most of the other medicines, a lot of this thing requires us to spend time with the patient. You want to make sure they know what the adverse events are. You want to know what the patient education therapy titration uh, needs to be done. And you need to counsel the family members. This may be a little more acceptable in patients with India, according to anecdotal and published experience that we have comparing our patients to the ones in uh, uh, Chandigarh. But it's not by far uh, something that can just, you can just give them lactulose in their hand and say bye-bye. You really have to spend time to actually do this because not only does a little bit does not work. A too much can also cause dehydration and hepatic encephalopathy itself. So even though the medication is quite cheap, the amount of human resources it takes to titrate this makes it relatively kind of expensive if you do not spend the time. So does that mean everyone should not get lactulose? Absolutely not. Even in the United States, where the acceptance is very low, 50% of the people are completely controlled just with lactulose alone. Um, again, in the United States, we don't have access to L-ornithine, L-aspartate, branch-chain amino acids, or everything else that are used in your country or countries that are in, in India and anywhere. But we want to make sure that I can give you only the, the, uh, the published data that we are familiar with. So hepatic encephalopathy recurrence, this is a, another landmark study, again, 10 years old now, uh, in which they randomized patients, more than 90% who were already on lactulose, 22% uh, got a recurrence in the rifaximin group, but 46 got a recurrence in the placebo group. And what's more, this prevented hepatic encephalopathy-related admissions. So where's the problem? Why isn't everyone on rifaximin or lactulose? More than 60% of patients did not receive ongoing prophylactic therapy to reduce the risk of HE recurrence after discharge. Many patients that we see and publish are in tertiary care centers, which we hope and I can tell you in the future slides, even that is not correct. We want to make sure that we consolidate the gains that we actually have. These are clearly published data. These are approved by most authorities, drug authorities across the world. You want to make sure that patients who are discharged with a diagnosis of overt hepatic encephalopathy have at least some medication on board, not for a limited time, but forever. The studies are actually for months and months and months. They're not for two weeks. They're not for one week. They're not for half a dose. They're for the exact same dose that were used in these studies. So you could say here, okay, these are, you know, tertiary care centers, you know, primary care centers who have uh, uh, hospitals. So maybe the advantage, maybe that you don't have enough awareness for encephalopathy. That's really not an excuse. We really need to give our patients the best care wherever we are. And if we can actually give more educational resources to promote the use of hepatic encephalopathy, record, prevention of hepatic encephalopathy recurrence throughout, this is something we really should be doing. So these were all patients in the United States. But what about tertiary care center? In this study from Naxel, which we know is a 14 um, center uh, study uh, uh, group across the United States and Canada, we took all inpatients with cirrhosis and we found that 1708 were admitted on hepatic encephalopathy therapy. And you can see out of the 1708, 99 were actually discharged without it for some strange reason. Even in tertiary care centers, 
99 patients of these were discharged without it. And 1102 who were on no HE therapy continued on that. So what we found that very few treatments, some people actually were discharged and this actually led to problems. People who were discharged on Lactulose had a lower, had a higher recurrence rate than only with rifaximin, regardless whether the Lactulose is rifaximin as well. So it's not just a problem of primary care centers or smaller centers, even in tertiary care centers, which 100% of Naxal belong to that, there is still opportunity for improvement, even in things that you think are so evidence-based, such as lactulose, rifaximin, et cetera. Again, as I said, I'm not going to focus about any other uh, medications at this point, uh, because these are the ones that currently are in the guidelines uh, across the world. What about persistent and recurrent precipitating factors? We already talked about the medications that are used. So what are the persistent and recurrent precipitating factors? According to the guidelines, here are the recurrent ones, electrolyte disorders, infections, of course, unidentified, constipation, diuretic dose, uh, overdose, and GI bleeding. And you can see number one and the second last one are pretty much the same. Most electrolyte disorders that happen in patients with decompensate cirrhosis have usually something to do with diuretics. So number one, check diuretic dose and prevent alkalosis. This is very important because if you start someone on diuretics or you change the diuretics within a week, they ideally should have a basic metabolic panel or at least, you know, sodium and uh, creatinine, et cetera. Uh, you want to ensure patients are on adequate SPP prophylaxis. In our practice, we only give SPP prophylaxis to someone who's had prior SBP and not in the primary care, uh, primary setting because of the multiple antibiotic resistance it's, uh, that we have actually discovered. Of course, we need to prevent un varicell bleeding and avoid unnecessary PPI use, which we are going to talk about in a little bit uh, from now. So regardless, this is an overview of all the recurrence that could happen. Your patient and every patient is unique. So whatever a respirating factor brought that patient to the hospital right now, you have to push back and think, is there anything that we can do to prevent this recurrence from happening? If yes, please act on it right now before the patient comes back with encephalopathy. So what are the medications that can modulate hepatic encephalopathy development and recurrence and can then precipitate encephalopathy, even though they were not really associated with encephalopathy at this admission? The reason why these are important, because many of them can actually make the person more likely to slip into mental status changes. As you can see, you take a cross-section of patients with cirrhosis, and you, if you figure out some way of giving them and all the same infection, not all of them will become confused. Many of them will actually uh, go through the UTI, get treated, or whatever infection you have, without actually developing encephalopathy. So why some of these other drugs are important? Because they may actually lower the risk where this potentially... Uh, uh, this, uh, this potentially, um, the, uh, epi the episode could potentially would have gone without uh, confusion to someone that acts an episode that can end up causing it confusion. So PPIs increase the risk. Withdraw if it is unnecessary. Do not get me wrong. PPIs are incredibly useful drugs. They've revolutionized the way we actually treat uh, acid peptic disorders. But many of our patients are on PPIs for unnecessary reasons. Clearly, if they are on for something that is not needed, stop it. Opioids. A lot of our patients in the United States are on opioids, and the opioids are higher. And I'm, I'm sure that the situation in India is much different. But in any case, it, we really struggle to reduce the dose and frequency. Statins reduce the risk, but don't start someone on statins. The, the, the current evidence is not strong enough for us to advocate statin initiation. However, if someone is on it, you could potentially continue. But there's still, they're coming up to be a lot more evidence in patients with decompensated cirrhosis that a higher dose of statins can be associated with rhabdomyolysis. So you've got to be very careful about this. What about beta blockers? They increase the risk likely related to portal hypertension. But again, if the beta blockers is to prevent a varicell bleed, you do not want to rob Peter and pay Paul. So you don't want to reduce the potential risk of HE, but then definitely precipitate hepatic and uh, precipitate varicell bleeding. So again, these things have to be taken in a grain of salt and also with what the patient's uh, current uh, situation is. Other neuroactive drugs, minimize benzodiazepines, gabapentin, and sleep aids. These are very important because the PK and PD of medications in cirrhosis is very, very different. For example, look at Valium and Ambien, which is a Zolpidem right here. You can see half-life is increased two to five-fold. 
and half-life increased twofold for Ambien, which is uh, which is Zolpidem, which is a sleep medicine. Look at morphine, fentanyl, uh, meperidine, uh, oxycodone, hydromorphone, everything here. Bioavailability is very high. And at least in child's class B or C, it becomes a problem. I would like you to check this out. Lewis et al. Elementary Pharmacology 2013. It's a very useful review, which will actually give you an idea of what to do with these patients. Because even though these drugs may not be the proximate cause for encephalopathy, they make patients much more likely to go into confusion, whereas without these drugs, they could have potentially gotten away without getting confused, and you could have treated their Medicaid, their infections, either as an outpatient or with an infection, uh, an inpatient without confusion. What about shunts? We know portal hypertension results in multiple shunts, which are intra-abdominal, in the varices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Can this actually lead to mortality risk and encephalopathy? Yes, absolutely. In this nice multi-center study by the Bavino Consortium, they did spontaneous portosystemic shunt measurements and multiple systemic shunts versus single shunts. There was a huge difference in the mortality and development of encephalopathy. So how can this be a problem? This can be a problem in patients who are not recovering. You give them everything. You give them lactose, you correct their precipitating factors or you don't find a precipitating factor. Then you do a cross-sectional imaging and you find they have shunts you can actually embolize these shunts and improve the course of encephalopathy. Well, who is the ideal candidate that will get this? Low MEL score and a single shunt are the groups of people who are much more likely to benefit from embolization. And these are the patients who are much more likely to have persistent encephalopathy without, rather than those who don't. So again, it's important when the patients either come back again and again with encephalopathy and you've really scratched your head and found nothing uh, that would explain this. Really, the other thing to then do is in those cross-sectional studies, look at whether this patient has shunts or not. What about nutrition? This is something that we often forget, inpatient as an outpatient, because this is not technically something that we are, you know, uh, consider. This is not something we write a prescription to. This requires a lot more uh, work, a lot more talking to the patient, and a lot more doing things that we usually are not either trained to do or not have time to do. So therefore, our dietitians are our friend. So if you look at, I'm um, sorry, let's go back to this. The daily energy intake should be 35 to 40 kilocalories of ideal body weight. If someone is obese or has ascites, that is not the body weight you want to do. You do not want to restrict protein. 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kg per day. Important, a late night snack is very important because as I told you when we started this, that the muscle is a big problem. When you talk about the muscle, you want to make sure that the muscle is not eaten up during the night because the liver with cirrhosis does not have enough glycogen to actually go through the starvation period at night. So small meals and liquid nutritional supplements even are distributed throughout the day and a late night snack should be offered. So what happens? Does this actually make a difference? In this study that we did in our centers, uh, we had retrospective education and prospective mar uh, marks of when we found out in patients with nutritional status whether we involved a dietitian and followed their recommendation. Then, once we found that, we actually educated the house staff, the hospitalist, the consultants, and the dietitian that patients with cirrhosis really should be seen by a dietitian. And prospectively, we then figured out whether this actually made a difference or not. So retrospectively, even in our two tertiary care centers, which you know people uh, publish constantly on cirrhosis, we only ask for nutrition consults in 40% of our patients with cirrhosis. The 90-day readmissions was 39%. Prospectively, nutrition consult increased 30% to 70% in these patients. And this involved a reduction in 90-day readmission to 28%. So simple things such as making sure that you focus on patients' nutrition, which have a big, big, prob big, big um, uh, contribution towards encephalopathy, can result in actual actionable items such as 90-day readmission reduction. So this is something we really must not forget. What about system-based design and health IT? Can we actually do something that makes us much more likely to discharge these patients on encephalopathy therapy or uh, uh, counseling? And can we keep in touch with these patients? In this nice study done by Dr. Tapper, they had three groups. One was a control group. They didn't do anything, the usual regular care. The second one was a checklist. Remember I told you Tokyo checklist before? The third one was an electronic phase. So checklist meant 
that you have to go through a paper checklist, but the patient can still be discharged. Electronic phase means until and unless everything in that electronic thing, which included things such as started them on lactulose, rifaximin, et cetera, was done, this patient could not be discharged. So sad to say, the only thing that worked with us doctors was the electronic phase. Only when we were forced to do something which would hold up something we want to do for the patient, we actually did what needed to be done. Does this sound familiar? It does sound familiar. We want to do the barest minimum because we are very busy. But if that barest minimum means that the patient is going to come back in two weeks in a much worse condition than he or she was before, then that barest minimum should not be the one we should be adhering to. What about keeping in touch in these patients? In this study that we had done, we communicated with this patient using this patient buddy app. And every day, the patient had to put something in of whether they were taking their medicines, including diuretics, they had to do their actual uh, weight. And they actually also had to have an, a caregiver who was entering their orientation status. And what we found in 30 days, more than eight encephalopathy related admissions were prevented because of this. And I can tell you each admission, which does not go to the uh, ICU in the United States is more than $35,000. Okay. Uh, this is actually a big cost saving. So eight free admissions within 30 days seems like very little to you, but it pays for the entire groups of people who are involved in this. And this is very cost effective because readmissions are so expensive, especially readmissions that make it to the intensive care unit are even more expensive. So it actually pays a lot to actually uh, focus not only to the patient, but to the caregiver. Here, both the patient and the caregiver had their own smartphones or an app that they used to actually put things together. We are right now doing a randomized uh, double uh, randomized trial in this across uh, the RV, two three centers across the United States, and hopefully in, we can actually get some this uh, some good results from that as well. What about gut microbiota as predictors and modulation for HE prevention? In this studies, uh, gut microbiota are clearly associated with brain function. Whether you talk about things related to the uh, MRI, whether you talk about colonic microbiota, whether you talk about microbiota that is in the saliva, whether you talk about microbiota that is actually in the stool. And in this nice study done from Taiwan, patients who are admitted with encephalopathy, those who had a poor outcome versus a good outcome, you could actually define them by the microbiota that was done then. So microbiota clearly have a way to do it. And we know lactulose and rifaximin act on the microbiota. But despite that, people keep on coming with encephalopathy, which then leads us to the question, what more can we do with these patients? So you know, the fecal microbiota transplant has taken off in a large way in C. difficile. But in encephalopathy, we want to actually do this. In, in, we did it in patients who had already were in lactulose and rifaximin. Basically, in the United States, we had nothing more to offer them. We drank the donors that we had in our potential stool bank to those who had the highest lactnospiracy and ruminococcaceae. This group is these bugs produce short chain fatty acids, produce secondary bile acids, and are usually associated with good outcomes and are overrepresented in controls. This is a phase one study in which we actually randomized people into antibiotics plus this FMT versus standard of care alone. And we found not only was it safe, because that was our first thing, because this being a phase one study, it reduced hospitalizations, improved cognition, and recovered the encephalopathy, it's an antibiotic associated uh, microbial diversity. But again, the end was only 10 in each group. We then did this with a capsule instead of an enema without antibiotics. And we found not a massive effect of encephalopathy, but a clearly a reduction in total hospitalizations. This was again accompanied by improvement in the bile acids. And what we found is within two weeks, if the secondary bile acids increased, this person was able to have successful engraftment. Basically, the, dose, the donor was able to engraft uh, their microbiota into the patient in that. So that was very relevant as well. Again, another thing I must stress again and again is caregivers are important. Caregivers are, as you said, as we said, your eyes and ears. They're part of your team. They're actually suffering as well. So if you do not want to take, if you want to make sure, make sure your patient is handled correctly, you have to handle your caregivers or at least acknowledge their suffering because it can render the patient incapable of self-care. 
they have a lot more disruptions of their activities on, of daily living, their functional disability, and there's a huge burden associated with cost, strain, and time. So a simple acknowledgement that this is something that you know is bothering them is very important for these patients. So again, important questions at the time of discharge. How can we prevent this from happening again? Is the patient able to perform all activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living? Are the caregivers able to handle the patient? Is this patient a transplant candidate? These are the things we need to ask and the take home messages. Overt encephalopathy staging across the four axes during inpatient settings to improve treatment and prevent readmissions is important. Appropriate use of therapies to prevent recurrence, improving nutrition, optimizing medicines, and ensuring contact with caregivers are important. Checklists on discharge may be helpful, especially if included in the IMR. Microbial uh, alterations as prognosticators and FMT are potential emerging fields of management. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Professor Bajaj, it was really a treat. You had uh, made such lucid presentation of uh, bench to bedside. So how can we care for our patients uh, with recurrent encephalopathy? So what are the measures? Uh, it was really nice. And thank you so much and for joining us, taking time off today. And uh, I, I would like to make an announcement before uh, Professor Dharmesh uh, starts his talk that all the viewers can post their questions on the chat box. As soon as Professor Dharmesh completes his talk, then we'll move on to, uh, you know, like uh, uh, having a discussion with all the three panelists. So uh, now may I request Professor Dharmesh to enlighten us on ammonia. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And wonderful to be a part of this webinar. Are my slides seen? Uh, yes, sir. You can hide that. Uh, yeah. Sure. Fine. So Thank you. As we have heard from uh, Dr. Jess that uh, hepatic encephalopathy is not only a very debilitating condition in the time course of a cirrhotic patient, but the, 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 the fact that it's almost like a revolving door concept and the patient keeps coming back and forth to the hospital with repeated admissions also uh, requires us to do something substantive about this. Now, we all know that central to the pathophysiology of hepatic encephalopathy has been ammonia. And this is one of the first things that was mentioned in Dr. P. N. Rao's curtain razor. We all know that ammonia is a waste product of amino acid metabolism. It comes from the gut. So the sources is the protein that is, that is consumed by us as uh, our food, as our nutrition, as well as urea that is derived from the blood and that is broken down by the urea breaking uh, uh, microbiota in the gut and that leads to generation of ammonia. The levels of ammonia that are seen in the blood, they vary with age. So most adults will have values of 35 mic moles per liter. And henceforth in the talk, I'll only be talking about the numbers and not the units. So this is the standard unit. You could either say micrograms per deciliter or mic moles per liter. So most of us would have a value of less than 35 and different studies have used different cutoffs as we'll see during the course of this talk. In a neonate, these levels could be much higher. They could go up to 50 to 75 mic moles. And in preterm neonates, it could even go up to 150 mic moles. So we should remember those of us who look after or care for kids, especially those with urea cycle enzyme defects, which is one of the indications for liver transplant, these values you should remember at the back of your mind. So most of the ammonia metabolism is actually its detoxification. So it's something which is toxic to the human body. And we have known that for a long period of time. So Dr. Rao alluded to the first uh, vascular anastomosis that was ever done in human beings, which was the egg fistula, which was a end to side portocoval shunt. And it was seen that when these animals, they were uh, fed meat, that led to an abnormal cognitive function, which was called meat stupor. So this was probably because of ammonia intoxication in these individuals. So whatever was the gut derived or the portal viscera drained ammonia that could not be metabolized as this blood was shunting the liver. So in the liver, the, there are two main zones which take care of the ammonia. So you have the zone one where you have the urea synthesizing hepatocytes and bulk of the ammonia that is derived from the portal drained viscera 
that actually goes to these hepatocytes and a very small proportion less than 20% goes to zone 3 hepatocytes which actually uh, detoxify ammonia by combining it with glut glutamate to form glutamine and this urea that is synthesized by the uh, by the liver is then excreted through the kidney and as you might believe the concentrations of portal vein ammonia levels are at least 5 to 10 times higher in than in the systemic circulation and most of this uh, will be converted to either urea or glutamine in its passage through the liver. So artery or the vein, that is the question. So the rest of the talk, I'll just talk of some key questions which keep popping up as we manage these patients with hepatic encephalopathy because uh, what Dr. Bajaj did not mention in his talk is that most of the therapies that are uh, used in management of hepatic encephalopathy, he alluded to lactulose as well as rifaximin, they're actually ammonia centric. And there are a number of others, including ammonia scavengers or things which would uh, break down urea in the gut and not allow the bugs to act on the urea to again generate ammonia like OP, like uh, sodium benzoate, like uh, a host of other ammonia scavengers that we do not have for clinical use available to us right now. So the first question that you need to ask is whether somebody who comes to you with a confused state and who has a background of cirrhosis, what, you, what should you be sampling? Is it the artery or the vein? And this is one study which I would like everyone to read. The study was published many decades ago and it was actually an eye-opener for me while preparing for this particular webinar. So you could see in this study that various grades of hepatic encephalopathy, one can see that the arterial ammonia levels are much higher than the anticubital vein ammonias across the grades of encephalopathy. This uh, study also showed that there is a huge overlap in the ammonia value. So like I said, most of us would have values less than 35. In serotics, most studies have taken values of in excess of 55 to 60 as being abnormal, though we really do not know how low is a normal ammonia in a given serotic. So you can see in the red rectangles, that even values as high as 100 to 150 are seen across the board. So you see that in patients with grade one as well as in grade four. However, it is also worth mentioning that as the grades of encephalopathy increase, the ammonia levels also increase. So this is something that we find very akin to the acute liver failure setting, where again, we lo look at the arterial ammonia values rather than the venous ammonia values. However, there is a stark difference. Most patients with high grade encephalopathy in the setting of acute liver failure do have an indwelling arterial line for their pressure measurements and that is not always the case in cirrhotic patients and therefore many studies as you will see in the next few minutes have also used the venous ammonia values to follow up these patients and see what happens to the ammonia values during management. So the message is loud and clear that arterial ammonia values are higher than the venous ammonia values but it's a mixed bag across the grades of encephalopathy you can see various levels of ammonia. Do ammonia levels always correlate with the grade of HE? So the, this is an oft quoted study also alluded to by Professor Rao. So this was a study from uh, Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Again, you can see the rectangle suggesting that across the board, even in grade four HE, you have some patients who've got an arterial ammonia values which are less than 50. For this particular study and for this center, the upper limit of normal was 47 mic moles per liter. But as can be seen, that values of 150 or higher are probably seen only in grade 3 or grade 4 HE. That means as the ammonia levels rise, you are likely to get higher grades of encephalopathy. But a particular value of ammonia cannot predict what grade of encephalopathy you will have. These workers also showed that there was a good correlation between the arterial ammonia, the venous ammonia and the partial pressure of ammonia. So please remember that ammonia exists in two forms in human circulation and when we say ammonia we actually are referring to the total ammonia but most of it is in the gaseous form which is NH3 and the, the sorry most of it is in the NH4 form which is ammonium ion. So the pKa for ammonia is 9.8 and you as you know that the normal physiologic pH is between 7.35 to 7.45. So most of the ammonia, it exists as NH4+. plus. The NH3 is the one which is rapidly permeable across the membrane, cell membranes, because it is a gas. So this particular study found that the partial pressure of ammonia across the board, that means when you had patients with grade 0 or grade 1, which is covert HE, as you heard in the previous talks, even in those patients, you could have elevated partial pressures of ammonia. 
in fact 50% of patients in this particular study had values of grade uh, had encephalopathy grades of 0 or 1 if you see this particular box plot uh, graph you can see that in grade 2 the median ammonia levels are actually less than the median ammonia levels in grade 1 so that is why there is a poor correlation between the arterial ammonia levels and the grade of he however at higher partial pressures of ammonia you see higher grades of encephalopathy another study from peter ferenci's group however suggested that we should almost always be using the partial pressure of ammonia rather than we should rather than using the ammonia levels in the blood and they found that there was a better correlation a r value of 0.69 when we were using the ammonia levels and an r value of 0.79 when we were using the partial pressure of ammonia to uh, diagnose he and in this particular uh, study the he was also correlated with somatosensory evoked potential at the median nerve so there was an equally good correlation between the pnh3 with the sseps also and there was increased latency at higher grades of coma so the message is that probably the ph is important so it's extremely vital to to factor in uh, patients ammonia levels with the patient's ph and this is something that we as clinicians often times do not do so this is something which is again very similar to the acute liver failure setting so if i tell you that there is a patient who's got chronic liver disease whose ph is 7.43 and he's got an ammonia value of 110 and i tell you that there is a patient with chronic liver disease with a identical meld score but his ph is 7.52 and he has an ammonia of 110 these two patients are different and maybe this is something that should come up in discussion because clinical chemistry in the context of ammonia interpretation is very very exciting and most of the times on bedside rounds we never ever think about it so we just go with the absolute ammonia values and start to chase it so it's extremely vital to know the context in which you are measuring the ammonia and ph is a very very strong determinant of that mind you ammonia can produce protein changes to the ph so as I mentioned that it, in the gaseous form, it's freely permeable across cell membranes. Most of it exists in the ammonium form as you reach an alkaline pH because the pKa for ammonia is 9.8. More and more of it will not be NH4 plus form, but it would be in the ammonia form. So it can lead to an alkalemia, whereas because it distorts the intracellular machinery for energy kinetics, it leads to an intracellular acidemia. So again, I will repeat because this is a confusing concept. So as you have an alkalosis, you have more of the ammonia as in the ammonium gaseous form as NH3. However, because ammonia is toxic to the cells, not just in the brain, but in a number of other organs that have already been alluded to, we find that the intracellular pH becomes acidic. So there is a quick transition of the ammonia to further enter into the acidic uh, medium of intracellular space so this forms actually a greater shift of the uh, the blood ammonia intracellularly and hence perpetuating this cycle of toxicity can ammonia disposal reserves uh, can ammonia disposal reserve predict survival so most of us know that in patients who have got mhe and uh, dr just has probably done seminal work in this area most of the patients of mhe we can predict that they are going to develop OHE or overt hepatic encephalopathy. But what we cannot say is whether they are going to survive or whether that can predict survival in these patients or not. So there comes this concept of the oral glutamine test. So 10 grams of glutamine is dissolved in 100 mils of water and the patient in a fasting state ingests this and you measure the ammonia levels at 30 minutes and 60 minutes. This is a Spanish study and these workers have done extensive work on uh, OGC or uh, OGT or oral glutamine test. So what basically happens is that the ammonia is generated from the small bowel and it is measured in the plasma. And in this particular study, which was first published in 2004, they showed that if somebody had a minimal HE, but also an abnormal oral glutamine test, their chances of survival were 80% at one year and 40% at three year. So like I said, that per se MHE cannot predict survival even though it can predict overt HE. Per se an abnormal oral glutamine test cannot predict survival. But if you were to combine these two and in effect this is actually the body's ability to dispose of ammonia. You find that it definitely uh, hurts the survival. However, if you have got uh, no MHE 
or you have got uh, uh, MHE, but you have got no abnormal oral glutamine test. That means the levels do not rise after giving you oral glutamine. Then survival is 95% at one year and 85% at three years. In this particular study, they defined the 60 minute value as more than 125 mic moles. These authors have again published their work in the year 2019 and divided cirrhotics into low risk, intermediate risk and high risk patients. It is somewhat similar to what we talk in terms of relative adrenal insufficiency. So if your baseline values of ammonia are high and response to oral glutamine test also increases your ammonia values, then you are probably in the high risk group and that further hurts your survival. What happens to those patients who develop an overt HE? So again, like I said that these are this was a prospective study and none of these patients had ever had OHE in the past. None of these patients were on non-absorbable disaccharides or on rifaximin. And when they were followed up, it was seen that an episode of overt HE really hampers your survival. So it was about 60% at one year and 36% at three years. Most of the traditional figures have been 40% at one year and about 25% at three years. But I think there have been advancements made in the management of overt HE in the hospital setting. However, if they did not develop overt HE, then the survival was 96% at one year and 86% at three years. Please remember that this test is safe. And in this study, none of the patients at the OGT could actually preserve, uh, precipitate an episode of overt HE. So this is a safe thing and probably merits more work, especially in patients with MHE, to be able to classify whom we would want them, whom we would want to be on long-term term therapy. So this is a very contentious issue. And as Dr. Bajaj mentioned, these drugs, especially lactulose, has poor acceptance and rifaximin is prohibitively expensive in the Western world. Probably this might be food for thought to let us know who are the patients who would actually benefit from treatment and how long to treat them with. Can serum ammonia levels predict survival in a cirrhotic? So this is the next burning question. So this was... Uh, study again uh, published from Boston. It was a retrospective study published between 2007 to 2012. This was from Dr. Deliet Tapper's group, someone who's done a lot of work on ammonia in uh, chronic liver disease. So these were all patients who had decompensated cirrhotic. So mind you, these all patients had either an acute decompensation or they had presented with acute on chronic liver failure to this hospital. And what the authors really wanted to see was whether the admission ammonia could be a predictor of 30-day liver transplant-free survival or death, and 90-day liver transplant-free survival or death. What they found was that in these patients, while they were in the hospital, if there was a doubling of ammonia from the baseline value, it, has an, it had a hazard ratio of 1.21 for the 30-day outcome and a hazard ratio of 1.22 for the 90-day outcome. So this was a study which suggested that the admission ammonia levels, especially if they were not coming down with management, then they could really... Uh, have an adverse impact on the patient outcome. The values that they used were ammonia values less than 60 and greater than 60. And mind you, these were venous values. And as you can see in the table, that patients who were admitted with values of greater than 60 had a higher chance of going to the ITU, had a higher mean meld score, had higher organ failure scores as per the Cliff SOFA scoring system, and also had a higher incidence of death or a transplant at both 30 days and 90 days. So this is a study which showed that the admission ammonia values and what happens to them during the course of the hospital actually governs the number of organ failure scores as well as outcome for these patients. And this is in the, the negative direction. This was a study which was published recently. And this was a study published from the All India Institute as well as University College London. Uh, I found this study a little intriguing because it has enrolled patients from different time points. So it has enrolled patients uh, not in the distant past from All India Institute, but patients from the Cliff Consortium, which was actually done almost eight, nine years ago from the UCL. And most of these patients, they had acute on chronic liver failure. So what was seen was that the serum ammonia values, they correlated with the survival probability. So those patients who did not have first, let's talk about the HE and its impact on survival. So those who did not have uh, any HE, grade 0 or 1, that is covert, they had the best outcomes. And those who had cerebral failure, so mind you, the easel uh, classification talks about cerebral dysfunction and cerebral failure. And those who had cerebral failure, they had much worse outcome. So further subdividing the patient cohort into those who had ammonia values of less than 79 and more than 79, 
for the entire cohort again um, admission ammonia value of more than 79 meant worse outcomes even for the covert he it meant worse outcome for grade 2 he it meant a worse outcome however this discriminant function was lost at a higher grade of encephalopathy or cerebral failure that means that grade 3 grade 4 he there was no difference whether the ammonia levels were less than 79 or more than 79 so what does this mean so this probably means that these patients with acute and chronic liver failure they have got other organ failures which probably have a dominant effect on the patient's survival and it's not just the cerebral failure so again as one would want to believe that ammonia levels might have a discriminant value in deciding who's going to survive the hospitalization and who's going to not but probably at higher grades of encephalopathy this might not be of great utility and lastly does chasing ammonia levels help in clinical practice and for this this is probably the most impactful study so this was again work from don rocky's group what they did was that over a 10 year period they enrolled patients uh, they they looked at the data of patients who were admitted with he and they found that those in whom there was there was a group in whom the ammonia levels were measured at the time of admission and those in whom it was not measured and they found that in those in whom it was measured 328 out of 551 had elevated ammonia levels and 223 of the 551 did not have ammonia levels so what were they trying to see they were trying to see that these patients and that is how an ohe is managed is by giving them lactulose and there was no difference in the amount of lactulose that was given to these patients on a daily basis during their hospital stay whether or not the ammonia was measured if the ammonia was measured whether or not the ammonia was high or not so this is what these graphs tell you the left hand side graph tells you that the he resolution ammonia sample taken or not taken at admission really does not matter and the right side graph he resolution ammonia levels were high or ammonia levels were normal so really it did not matter so probably this is a veritable nail in the coffin for ammonia assessment or ammonia assay in patients who present with cirrhosis and he so as dr uh, p n rao said that there are some things that we do which uh, we really do not put too much of uh, thought into and just order it so where where does this lead us to so what is what is the final take that a clinician should have when you are asking for ammonia in a patient who's having impaired neurocognitive function and who's got background cirrhosis a mention was made of uh, dr jasmohan bajaj's excellent article on unanswered questions in patients with he and i would really want to pick his brains on this so we first remember about ammonia from chronic liver disease which was the ek fistula model but whatever we have borrowed subsequently is from the acute liver failure setting so in acute liver failure setting ammonia really has a discriminant value so people who've got an ammonia values of more than 120 or 150 and according to some 200 micmoles per liter it actually might be an indication to change their management plan so we might even want them to be on a filter so that you could handle this ammonia but this is really not what we do in the patient with chronic liver disease the unanswered questions is what is the role of brain water so there are very few studies very few and far between which have looked at the concept of cerebral edema in the presence of in the setting of chronic liver disease even in the setting of aclf most studies have quoted this figure to be 5 to 8% but i think it is actually much much higher and the literature is really found wanting in this particular area we have not looked critically at the role of cerebral blood flow as well as auto regulation so these are the two key drivers of whatever happens to ammonia neurotoxicity in the setting of acute liver failure but this has really never been studied in chronic liver disease so why are some patients with hepatic encephalopathy very agitated and why are some patients uh, mute so this is something that probably has got to do with cerebral blood flow is there a dissociation between the cortical flows and the subcortical flows is there a difference between the anterior circulation and the posterior circulation and i suspect that these differences do exist it is just that they do not figure into our scheme of things on a day to day basis similarly with auto regulation so if it is so vital in patients with acute liver failure you might argue that patient with chronic liver disease they might have had time to have an exchange of osmoles across the astrocytes and in because of paucity of time i could not dwell on that but maybe it will figure up in discussion but then this would only be to a small measure and auto regulation of cerebral blood flow remains very very important concept what is the role of cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen what is the role of cerebral metabolic rate for glucose so we all talk about 
a substrate problem so how do patients with sepsis behave patients with sepsis behave because abnormally with respect to their hemodynamics and with respect to their microcirculation because there is a mismatch in what you are delivering and what the tissue is taking up which is the do2 vo2 concept is such a concept holding in the patients of chronic liver disease or not that has never been answered and if ammonia neurotoxicity is so central to he in cirrhotics then why are the following areas so poorly studied so let's start with monitoring so you will almost never hear of somebody bolting patients who got grade 3 4 uh, he even though their degree of uh, coagulopathy might be much much lower than patients with acute liver failure therapeutic temperature mod uh, modulation mannitol use of three normal cell line jugular bulb saturations for ammonia for lactate for glucose and what have you and this could just go on and on so i leave you with thoughts these thoughts and i think ammonia even though it is important in patients with uh, cirrhosis but probably not the most important thing to drive management of these patients and we all talk about inflammation which could be systemic inflammation or neuroinflammation we all talk about neurotransmission which undergoes serious changes and to some measure it might also be governed by the ammonia but then this is still a huge area and that is probably the reason why we use a kind of a hanuman approach in managing these patients with ohe so you will take away the precipitants you will give them lactulose you will give them rifaximin you will try to replenish their intravascular space you will treat their infection and you really do not know where ammonia comes in all of this with this i thank you and i'll be very happy to take any questions uh thanks uh, dr darmesh for that wonderful and lucid presentation so uh, we will now move on to the uh, panel discussion uh, we have uh, quite a few questions important questions which have come in so first i'll start uh, from the first question uh, which is from dr druba gaire from kathmandu nepal uh, his question is on decompensated liver cirrhosis with gross ascites and hepatic encephalopathy with diabetic ketoacidosis at presentation how to tackle because see he there he is a ds dcld patient who is fluid overloaded and he has dka so i pass this question to dr darmesh with a lot of work on intensive care uh, you know management all right so again this is one of my favorite subjects i i i wanted to mention this and we all talk about what is the nutrient for the brain so it's glucose and ketones as most of us hepatologists want to believe and i really challenge this concept so i don't think that ketones figure in a huge way as being nutrition for the brain cells so that is the first thing to say and the second thing to say is that patients with chronic liver disease who've got decompensated cirrhosis for them to present with dka is extremely unusual so what i would really suggest is for this patient to be evaluated for starvation ketosis rather than a dka so dka is a completely different state of an absolute insulinopenia and that is often times not seen in patients with chronic liver disease so some circulating insulin will always be there at least i have not seen patients presenting with dka when they have got decompensated chronic liver disease so i think one needs to just have a more careful look at what is going on they might have seen uh, ketones in the urine and in more uh, contemporary practice i would want all those who are logged in to be mindful of the fact that the new drugs that we use for management of diabetes and often times we are uh, guilty of not looking at the prescription which the patient is carrying the sdlt2 inhibitors can produce ketoacidosis so they can produce ketoacidosis with normal glucose value and that is something that one should be mindful of though i am not talking specifically in the context of a cirrhotic patient just your thoughts on that un unmute yourself please but my feeling is I, i agree with you that the extreme rarity of these conditions being together uh, mm. but the if the question is if you do find a patient right now i think the problem is that um, if the treatment is going to worsen one versus the other my feeling is if you truly have to choose between dk and he the dk is going to kill the person before if it truly is a dk and you have to fix that while you can do all the paracentesis that you want to actually drain the other stuff and give the patient albumin so same thing if you have a patient with 
alcohol withdrawal, who also comes in with encephalopathy. The benzodiazepines are going to worsen the encephalopathy, but the alcohol withdrawal with delirium tremens is going to kill the person. So you first make sure that the person is alive before you can actually fix all of those things. So the worst of the two evils in this, if it truly is a DKA, is the DKA. And in those two people, so I think with our um, society in which more and more patients with diabetes and obesity and cardiovascular disease are coming in later in their lives, we often have to make these potentially contradictory choices and you just have to step back and see what is worse. But I think your point about the new SGLT2 inhibitors are, is really critical. And also, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's also a, a more predisposition to UTI and stuff like that because of. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, because it leads to more glucose excretion. So, UTI is a contraindication or recurrent UTI is contraindication to use of these drugs. Not just UTI, but even balanoprostitis, which is not uncommon in these patients here. Yeah. I think uh, that is what makes uh, clinical decision making really challenging in these guys because of the complexity of the situation of comorbids. We have another interesting question which has come from Northeast Frontier. Sonam from Thimpu has asked a question. What is the early treatment? How early should we treat for, uh, you know, recurrent acute hepatic encephalopathy? And uh, how, how early should we diagnose for preventing further episodes? I pass this question to Professor Bajaj. I think you should be doing this immediately after the patient has recovered for their first episode of aging. You should not wait till their second, third, or fourth episode. And some of these things are really a checklist that we had spoken about. And many of the checklists, if you think, is just common sense, things that we That's should right. be anywhere. It's just that it's in the heat of the moment when you have like 10 other patients to discover, to, to take care of, you know, your clinic is running late and you're getting all these phone calls and WhatsApp messages from every single person in town, you kind of forget. And a lot of these things can be handled by a nurse. A lot of these things can be handled by a juniors, but they should not should be handled by one way or the other. And I think counseling of the patients and the family members should begin immediately because it requires a lot for that to get in. But the treatments in hand and everything, do not wait till they come in for their second episode. At this stage, the covert or minimal hepatic encephalopathy treatment is not really standard of care. So if you're diagnosing someone with that, it's up to you, between you and the patient, whether to actually treat the person. But clearly, someone with overt encephalopathy who has now recovered is worthy of your time and attention because that patient will be back otherwise. So just do you see merit in this concept of oral glutamine test? So someone who's got an MHE, and also normal OGT, would you be happy to put them on medication? Of course, I know you are restricted by financial constraints, not so much in this country. But do you think it adds value to our management plan? So if you look at countries in which, say, suppose in Denmark, they, if it, they do they have a very robust covert HE treatment strategy. Uh, and if they find someone covert HE, they don't bother with oral glutamine. Uh, and they give them, you know, whatever is lacturose, whatever is needed by their, you know, they also have like an NHS kind of service. But covert HE is uh, the market as HE, so they can give whatever they want. But it's it's not had a huge difference in their reduction. So because when we because the reason is I collaborate with them and we do the you know comparison of our group versus there. It's not a, in the real world. It does not cause a big difference in the availability of that. So I certainly I I'm happy if someone does a covert HE test. Leave alone follow it with an OGTT, which takes you know take even longer to do and needs to be much more standardized. For me, I go with what the patient is telling you. If the patient is telling you they're tired, if their family members are telling them they're not completely with it, then if you do a test that is abnormal, giving them a medication that is either more expense for them and has more side effects now has a rooting in what was bothering them in the first place. So if you join the dots, your tiredness, your sleepiness, your inability to concentrate on your job may be linked to and I can fix it with this, it's much more likely that you're actually going to get acceptance from the patient and their family members for this, rather than our research protocol in which we test everyone who has said yes to the study. So in clinical practice, those are the people I usually end up testing for HE as part of clinical practice. And those are the people who have a much more acceptance, even with lacturose in the United States. 
Uh, now we are I think, can I can I just add to this? Uh, I think the the important point which Dr. Jasmohan Pujaj has made is knowing about the precipitating factors, except especially in our country here, drugs are the one of the major things and constipation is another one. In the drugs, especially these people receive gabapentin, which you mentioned, uh, the diabetics with a neuropathy, something, and he goes to a neurologist and then takes a gabapentin. And the tramadol also, again, this is some small pains, you know, they keep taking this one. And it's very important to take a drug history in these people. Uh, just what do you think the sedative, good sedative, do you use the lorazepam or oxazepam for people who say that uh, I, I can't sleep? I, for, it, it depends on how advanced their cirrhosis is. If they're really, really very advanced, I leave them alone. No, 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 sorry, correct. The reason being is, you know, many of these patients are not working. Okay. I give them a practical understanding. You know, you have encephalopathy and you also have a melatonin problem. Okay. If I give you melatonin, which is, by the way, if you give a small dose of melatonin, it's okay. You give, you give a higher dose, it becomes a problem. So if a patient, our problem comes because the rest of the world is sleeping at night and these people are awake, okay, they have nowhere to go the next day. But they find themselves, because of societal pressure, forcing themselves to sleep at night while the hangover effect of that medicine lasts during the day. And they are basically useless during the night and useless during the day also. So I tell them, do you have anywhere to be tomorrow morning? Do you have to drive? If not, sleep the day. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. If you have a work to do, yes, definitely. If you're driving, then, of course, we, we look at other things, such as melatonin. We also look at if there's any other medications that are causing them to be problematic. Or actually, a lot of our patients have sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea that is coexistent with them that causes them to have sleep problems and so they may not ever had encephalopathy in the past they just told the patient people i can't sleep at night i wake up my sleep wake cycle is altered and then slap before you know it they're on lacturose they're on rifaximin they're on lola they're on everything whereas the actual problem was sleep apnea it, to start with but the treatments that i often the treatment that are the least dangerous are potentially you know melatonin and uh, some in very rare we give a trazodone also uh, just just for their uh, you know uh, but otherwise there are unfortunately not many good treatments for these patients sleep uh, problematic mm -hmm. and the treatment of he is often not enough to reverse the sleep cycle uh, now professor rajaj going back to an lkg question so how do you diagnose a minimal change in encephalopathy in the clinic you know, if you're seeing a, do you do the written number connection test or what, what is the, uh, you know, status of visual uh, evoked potentials, the VEP, which used to be popular two decades back? So when I was starting my research career, there was already a very weary editorial, minimal HE, a constant source of discussion. Unfortunately, 20 years later, it's still ammonia and minimal HE and driving are the things that drive the encephal encephalopathy discussion. What I do in my clinic, I ask patients if they have symptoms. If they have symptoms, we have a separate clinic, which we actually refer them to. That separate clinic is a quiet room with a trained instructor who uses everything in a trained fashion, gives me a result. We have norms. At their norms, I basically went, go back through their entire history and see if there are any medications that can cause this. And I make a learned opinion that this person potentially has covert HE or not. So think about it. You're asking to make a decision on a patient's life, their ability to drive, their ability to work on something that takes five seconds. We don't do that for endoscopies. We don't do that for ultrasounds. This is something that is going to have huge changes to the patient. So if giving a number connection test while the patient is waiting, the phones are ringing, the patients are calling, there, is, there are overhead pages, there's 5 million people around the patient where the end point is time. So that is not fair to the patient or to you. So if you have to do it, you have to do it right. Otherwise, don't do it at all because it will end up into a muddled picture. And whatever you want to do, visual evoke potentials, the um, animal naming test, all of these have to be done by someone who is trained, has to be done by people who in an quiet room and ideally in a situation that is separate from a usual clinic. Your clinic should be, you basically go over all the results with the patient, whether it's ultrasound, endoscopy, 
testing, every kind of testing. And it should not be that you short circuit this MHE. So you no one demands a two second like immediate test for ultras for HCC. No one demands an immediate test for uh, you know looking for varices right now. Even for fibro scan, you send the patient away. So what we have had good success with is when the patient is getting their fibro scan, that is the time to actually do any of these tests because the patient and the provider are pretty much in a separate, quiet, private room because you don't do it in the middle of 5 million people. So again, my plea to everyone here is do not look for a test that in two seconds will give you something. You have to give MAT enough respect and not expect only that complication to give you an instant result. That is everything else you're willing to wait for another procedure, another appointment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I, I remember this uh, story, you know, like the doctor in the United States was interviewing a uh, cirrhotic patient uh, who was a farmer. So he said, I'll talk to you in your language, say there's a fence and you have 100 sheep this side and two of them jump over the fence. So how many will you have on the other side where, uh, you know, where all your sheep are there? And immediately he said, none. He said, no, way. it has to be 98. He told uh, the doctor, doctor, you don't understand. You're not a farmer. If you <laughs> jump over the fence, all of them jump over the fence. So that means both hepatic encephalopathy. So that again helps to uh, rule this out. But I have a question from Darshan Bangalore on role of mannitol in uh, grade 3 bar 4 encephalopathy. 3 or 4, grade 3 or grade 4. Uh, Professor Bajaj, so any of you can take up. Mannitol. Ramesh has a biggest uh, experience information doctor uh, so, so, so you know these these are the things uh, which we all do but uh, we do not uh, have uh, sound science behind it so that's what i said so we first learned about uh, the chronic liver disease scenario and protosystemic shunting and what ammonia can do then we learned that ammonia was very deleterious to the brain in the setting of acute liver failure and quickly we started to talk about the role of ammonia and chronic liver disease. So I think these are completely different uh, subjects and they are still not, in spite of so much of work being done in this area, these are the questions which have never been answered. So all of us know that we see patients with uh, cirrhosis grade 3, grade 4 who decerebrate. When a patient of acute liver failure decerebrates, even if you do not have ICP monitoring, you will quickly be jumping to starting either three normal saline or you will be giving him uh, mannitol. I'm not a huge fan of mannitol even in the ALF setting, but obviously you know, that is something you would do if you or other things are not in place. So I think these, are, the, these questions are difficult to answer. And why should this be any different from the ALF setting if you think that grade three, grade four, there is one study from Jules group, which has said that the incidence of uh, cerebral edema and acute on chronic liver failure is five to eight percent i don't believe that i think it's much much higher it's just been understudied okay so uh, with that i just want to get back to you dharmesh uh, post there's a patient who has undergone tips and he's get he gets uh, hepatic encephalopathy so uh, how do you manage it if the patient is not willing for liver transplant this first i want to professor pn rao to answer and then Dr. Dabish can add on. Okay, thank you. I think this is the first thing is, you know, commonest indication for the tips in our situation is refractory ascites. Uh, the acute bleed and then most of us, the infrastructure is not sufficient and also a rare indication for um, tips for the acute bleed. First thing is to see that, you know, is it a proper bean indication is there. And also we'll tell the patient that, you know, there is a chance of encephalopathy up to nearly about uh, 10 to 30% of these and a small percent that they do not even respond. Refractory ascites may not even respond. Uh, then the question comes on what size of the stent which has been put. Because, and another thing which I tell them normally is that, you know, we have a plan B. Is there anything? If the liver transplant is there, well and good. If the liver transplant is not there, then one our interventional radiologist can do is to reduce the size of the stent. If it's been put about 10 millimeters, then you can reduce to six. I mean, extremely rarely, they can also plug the shunt, you know, just like an undoing a GJ or some kind of a thing. Um, anything, Damesh, you know, apart from this, 
uh, this one in a post uh, yeah, so basically if someone develops an encephalopathy which is indolent to manage after tips i think the most important thing is for the hepatologist or the primary care provider to talk to the ir guy before the procedure is done that is the most important thing so i always tell our ir guys not to have a premeditated notion about how much they want to dilate the stent so we have to carefully look at what is the porto atrial gradient and we should not have more than 40 to 50% decline so that is what i would be telling them so i would probably err on the side of giving them diuretics for a while after a tips procedure rather than have them dilate it to an extent that the patient becomes encephalopathic the other things that you mentioned which is the modulation of the stent size they are they are, they are the accepted uh, things to do but patient acceptance is poor and of course it costs a lot of money so you have to put a stent in a stent and then you have to embolize the gap between the two stents. So this is an expensive procedure. In some studies also known to predispose to endotipsitis, which is very, very difficult to take care of. At times you must have to, might just end up blocking off the tips altogether if the patient is not a candidate for uh, transplant. So there was a study in the um, plenary session of the liver meeting that hopefully is going to come out in print soon. And the user refactor mm -hmm. in prevention of post he so it's not yet in print but it's going to come out soon yeah so just what we do for all these patients is to make sure that uh, you know they are adequately hydrated at least in the first few hours of the procedure because you know most of them will have a, a pigtail thing done the night before and they would lose a lot of volume by way of ascites we put all of them on lactulose and rifaximin and still we will have patients who would have uh, he yes. which is overt he and uh, I, I'm talking of those. So of course, that is that point is very well taken. We will put in the refaximin is not very expensive in our country. And like I said, in the course of the talk also, we use the Hanuman approach. So we use Lactulose or we use HE also. Many of us will use Lola also. We don't really know what is working, but we use everything. That's what our, it's called in, in every, <laughs> throw everything but the kitchen. Yeah, throw everything to add them, yeah. You know, as doctors, we want what's best for our patients. As researchers, we wish we had the luxury of finding out what worked, but you yeah. can't. You really can't have that luxury in most patients. I, I have a quick question coming up to Professor Bajaj. How frequently the smartphone application is used in the United States, and why is it not popular in other countries? Especially in India, everybody has one or two cell phones. Even the uh, last grade employees have two phones each. So, but why why is it not coming up, and how how much we are using in your country? The problem with smartphone apps is you have to have a human being at the end of it. So, if this app that I told you that you had they put in the uh, number of pills that they took a day. Someone at our end is to be available, like a call call center employee, to monitor if they said no. So it's not just a smartphone app <laughs> to realize it. <laughs> thousands, thousands and thousands of alerts. So you actually have to have someone at the end of that. And you have to educate the patients and the family members that bleeding happens. Fever happens. Do not wait for us to do this. Call whatever emergency services and go there. These are the expectations that you have to do for potentially using them for clinical use. When you're talking about things like MHD, etc., the smartphone next group app and other stuff that can be done on the phone, that is done under your supervision when the patient is in front of you. So that does not require acceptance, so to speak, but it has to be in a language that a patient can understand. So the patient's first language is not English. And you present them with a stroop app which says red, green, blue underneath. Or if the patient is colorblind, <laughs> red, green, blue underneath, it's not going to end up very well because the end point is time again. So if it is not in Telugu, if it is not in you know uh, Hindi, and if someone is illiterate, if it's not in actual ways that you actually do, it has to be done the correct way in a certain place. So there is a double translation. Of so you have a paramedical worker who's in your hospital who is available 24 by 7 to answer these calls or uh, you know you have uh, during the daytime time they just look at the apps and interact so with them yeah this is a research grant uh, in which we actually have coordinators who look at this once a day we told the patients the acceptance the, the because none of this are emergent things if they're emergent they call 
these numbers. They get a brochure with them to do that. Over the weekend, whoever the GI fellow on call knows, there's an iPad, a central iPad we have. And uh, thankfully, we don't have too many patients on this at the same time. So we have one or two patients. And there are one third that are randomized to standard of care also. So the burden is not as great. But in the initial study that we published in 2017, we quickly realized that it is way more than just a stroop with a smartphone. It is a human resource with, which just requires a smartphone instead of a phone <laughs> to call. Instead of the patients calling, they are actually doing, giving you information in another way, which you just have to have adequate staff. Otherwise, you give a patient and the caregiver the wrong expectations. And if you don't respond to their concerns, they will stop doing this. Uh, are they following it to the US, different centers or no? At this point, we are study between our centers and the Mayo Clinic to see if it is worth it. This, this app is available. Patient Buddy app is available. It's approved by, uh, it should be in the iOS store. Uh, but again, before you implement it in your practice, make sure there is someone to answer those questions. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Someone who is trained. Uh, question back to you. Uh, when can we restart diuretics once the patient recovers from hepatic encephalopathy? As a patient, you see in overt encephalopathy, you withhold the diuretics at least temporarily during the admission period. When do you restart? I I don't necessarily withdraw them completely in these patients as needed, unless we assume that the diuretics were causing hyponatremia or acute kidney injury that we thought was the reason for their encephalopathy. We decrease the dose a little bit, and as the patient gets better, and that was the point of one of my slides, was to actually bring them back within a week if you restart it to see whether they have AKI again. And at some point, every encephalopathy episode is a chance to reset the baseline for that particular patient. So now the patient who would be tolerating 100 mg of uh, furosemide and uh, you know 100 mg of spironolactone and 40 of furosemide now may have to be reduced to a little less of that. Uh, with this HE episode if they had AKI, which they never had before. So I, I don't have a blanket rule and every patient is separate. I don't know what you do, Dharmesh or Dr. Prasad. Yeah, yeah. so that's that's actually the most important point. If somebody who's uh, logged in wants to learn something from this webinar, that is, that is the punchline. So this is very common just in our country. The diuretic and lactulose-induced encephalopathy, actually they are the commonest yeah. other than constipation and non-adherence. And oftentimes, uh, doctors are guilty of uh, just continuing the same prescription. So what you also need to know is that if somebody has come with an abnormal neurocognitive function, what is their baseline sodium value? What are their baseline creatinine values? They might still be in the normal range, and it might still count for API. So all these things you have to factor in. And of course, at our center, we also use, do the urine lights, which is not mandatory, but we do them. And uh, more often than not, you would definitely have to tweak the dose of diuretics or, or you know, give them in a much more reduced manner, maybe alternate day or something like that. As, as uh, Professor Bajaj was speaking about the drugs and, uh, you know, you have to look at the prescription that the patient is taking because right now the family practitioner uh, system is gone in India. So there are many consultants giving many drugs and some patients religiously take everything. You know, I just remember just last week I saw a patient who came, a cirrhotic patient who came with acute kidney injury, which happened, uh, which never was there uh, three months earlier. Now it does. So going through the history, we couldn't find any precipitating cause. There was no UTA, nothing, no urinary tract obstruction. But what we found was the patient had two prescriptions of telmisartan, one coming from the I mean, the, uh, uh, you know, cardiologist, one coming from the diabetologist, and then the physician had given him Olmisartan. So he's taking two Telmisartans along with one Olmisartan. So, you know, so many Sartans at the same time in the same morning, every day, religiously, for months. So, because this prescription of the patient has to be definitely, you know, gone through very meticulously. Otherwise, we can make mistakes uh, in our practice. And I have a question uh, to, um, you know, Dharmesh. What is the role of BRTO in spontaneous hepatic encephalopathy with the large renorenal shunt? I think you answered that. No, but uh, we were talking about tips. What about right. the reno natural renorenal shunt? So, 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 I, so I think any patient who's got uh, incomplete resolution of his HE episode or has uh, 
continuous or ongoing neurocognitive impairment, especially at low mild scores, as uh, Dr. Just alluded to, we should have a cross-sectional imaging done in them. And if you find that there is one or two dominant shunts, then you should definitely try to block those. And there is enough data in published literature to suggest that. More contentious, and I would like to pick uh, Justice Brains on this is, what are your thoughts on improving portal flow in patients with chronic liver disease? So that is a that is something that we don't do or think of often. You know, so at the end of the day, the portal derived viscera, the blood flow, if it goes where it is meant to go, do you think that would have an impact on the patient's at least medium term outcome? I, it's a very interesting question. I, I've not really thought about that in great detail at this stage because I don't know how to practically make it happen without mm -hmm. dropping Peter to pay Paul. You know, if you put, you know, something goes, something or the other, one complication goes up and the other one goes down. Yeah. Even BRTO, there's always a concern that, you know. Absolutely, yeah. So that's what, because these patients are so fragile, you know, you might suggest something meaning well for the patient and it might just uh, boomerang on you with, with, with the disaster. Yeah. But but of course, if you theoretically look at the concept, anything which would augment the flow to the liver should definitely uh, favorably alter the course of a complication like HE. Yeah, but the only way to do it right now is the tips, which again, it yeah. completely bypasses the liver. Yeah. Technically, it yeah. goes to the liver, but the liver yeah. is kind of a way station. It just... so, 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 so the difference between BRTO and, uh, uh, and tips is this, that BRTO, you are taking away only that shunt so that the forward flow would continue to go to yeah. the liver. So that is exactly what I had in mind. But many a times you would have many shunts, which is impractical to yeah. clog. But if you have got one or two shunts, then definitely it is worthwhile. And you know just that there is a lot of work, at least in some centers in the US, especially the Northwestern, where yes. they are now also very aggressively trying to repermeate portal veins in yes. patients who have got uh, portal vein thrombosis, even going on to the extent of cavernomatous changes. Yes. So I think there is there is some scientific uh, uh, logic behind this, that if you augment the portal inflow, that would definitely take away some complications of liver disease, but maybe not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah. OK, so again, to one more question to Dr. Darmesh, and then all the panelists can also uh, you know, uh, put in their inputs. Uh, what is the role of flu mazinil in reversing hepatic encephalopathy and benzodiazepine receptor agonist ligand? So, what is its role? Is that a role? Yeah, we we don't use it. So, you know, these things are uh, good for historical perspectives. Things like uh, flu mazinil, bromocriptine. Yeah, you know, they 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 good. They make good reading, but we don't use it in clinical practice. Flumazenil can reverse the neurocognitive impairment, but it's very transient, and it will come right back. And it so, causes seizures. So it's yeah, a no no, it complete no no, no yeah. no. Whoever's using it, please don't use it. So You'll make these, things worse. Yeah, it's a very so, easy question to answer. No. Yeah. So flumazenil. Uh, Any. Comments on flumazenil in reversing acute hepatic encephalopathy. Say somebody, you know, is admitted. He has to sign some uh, legal documents. Can we give flumazenil? Wake him up. Wake him. Sign. Then I want him to go back. <laughs> the doctor will go to jail. <laughs> so Every, many family. people will go to jail. Many, not just doctor. Everyone involved. <laughs> sir, unmute your mic. Sir, Pian Rao, sir, unmute your mic. Rao, sir, unmute your mic. Unmute. This we have used it when we were DM students, you know, when it just came, papers came of the flumazenil role intravenously, one milligram, and it was not available also. And uh, only in overdoses of uh, this one, if you suspect that there is an overdose of benzodiazepine, definitely, then it may have a role there. Yeah, and especially in patients with cirrhosis who are sedated after endoscopies. Mm -hmm. You had a long endoscopy and you've no idea. Then, yes, but then you're not reading encephalopathy like Dr. Okay. Rao said. It's a big difference between this. So the theoretical things behind it is very good. The peripheral benzodiazepine receptors, and you know gabapentin and benzodiazepines worse in HE. The problem is we don't have a drug that is safe that can actually translate that into a patient without causing problems of their own. So I, I have used it 30 years ago on two patients in intensive care. One responded transiently, of course, for a few hours. And they got a thumbprint. It's like, <laughs> here. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. So I have a question to all the three panelists. Anyone can pick up this, but all of you can answer. What is the negative predictive value of ammonia? Say, a patient is clinically diagnosed to have hepatic encephalopathy, but has a normal ammonia level. So clinical predictive value. Is there a clinical predictive value for that? The so only thing we ended up agreeing on was that yeah. if a so, patient is confused and the ammonia is normal, normal, we then this is most ammonia. likely not encephalop. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Because yeah. all the yeah. stuff related to ammonia yeah. increases yeah. the uh, makes the ammonia higher than it what you usually should be. Yeah. So, so the so ammonia is low is likely unlikely to be. Yeah. So if this patient were not to get better, then you should seriously challenge your uh, diagnosis. Yes, so, correct. Because you do not really know what a normal ammonia level is. So but the flip is not true. Remember, just because this is right does not mean a, an, an alert person with a high ammonia level has HE. Has a, HE, yes. absolutely. Yes. So that is actually, that is a bigger crime because many yes. people, and you get consults on this all the time. So, you know, somebody's ammonia is 250, underwent a gruesome oncologic surgery, and they are continuously calling up to say this patient is going into impending liver failure. So, you, you know. That is something that uh, takes your peace away more often than not. But coming to the question that you asked, uh, Dr. Vijayam, about uh, the low ammonia or a normal ammonia. So we do not know what is a normal ammonia. So even if you see studies of yester years, which were much, much better done than the studies of the current era, you will find that there is a huge uh, range of normal ammonia values. And therefore, if someone has background chronic liver disease, you have the baseline ammonia, you have put into place whatever you do to treat that HE. And if this patient is still not getting better, then probably this is the chap I would want to take up for imaging, even if he was having high grade coma or do a CSS study or do an EEG, yeah. something like that. I think he's got a very good, very good point in the sense that if it is persistently or if it is normal, we should look for other causes, especially the primary intracranial events. So would you do a, a brain imaging straight away if there is no infection, diuretics and things like that, or bleed, mm -hmm. you don't have any precipitating factors that are recognizable, uh, would you do an MRI or a CT? Maybe MRI might be difficult. No, this this, this, this should be an absolute no. So unless you have focal deficits or you have localizing signs, you don't take these patients for imaging. Or this so, is the patient's first episode. Yeah, where absolutely. you have no idea what the hell is happening. So, so, so yeah. the thing about the ammonia being normal and somebody having persistent encephalopathy, then you put all these things in practice. Not, not if you know that somebody's got chronic liver disease and ammonia value is say fifty. So it's not that you would not treat it as HE. You would treat it as HE. The patient is not getting better. You switch gears. And you know, like buying a tourniquet and collecting plasma venous sample or mm -hmm. sending it uh, after one hour to the laboratory. Will that all matter in ammonia levels? Well, I put, I put in, yeah, I put an, okay. e put a thing in the chat box. This is a study that is freely available in which we did this, ideally, in eight centers across the U.S. And we found huge variabilities in ammonia levels yeah. compared to a central lab. That just tells you that it's not the perfect test. But again, it has to be used as one of the many things, like we do in any other diagnosis. This cannot be the only reason you decide yes or no. It cannot be in, used in a vacuum. Like with everything else, you have to put all those things together. And if it adds up, it's good. If it doesn't add up, you have to figure out that it's either an outlier or something that is not HE at all. So I have to go. Sure. Uh, I, I think uh, you should uh, probably a rapid fire one minute each. If you want to, before you wind up, first to Professor Jasmohan Bajaj before he leaves. So just a one minute comment, sir, from all three of you, starting with Bajaj, sir, PM Rao, and then Dharmesh. Thank you. What, I have commented enough. I've been commenting throughout. <laughs> well, thank you. I think this was a very nice clinically oriented seminar, and I'm glad there's such uh, engagement here. But there's a lot of questions still streaming in that I'm sorry we didn't have, uh, I didn't at least have time to look at. Um, and I believe we have a lot of things. We have to think outside the box when we come to talking as doctors. We have to actually think of the patient, their family, and many logistic concerns, like you pointed out, Dr. Prasad, about the using the three different uh, medications that this person is using. It's something as simple as that, that we don't believe that we are trained. We don't believe it's, it's our job 
to look at it. It is our job. Our job as doctors for patients to recognize hepatic encephalopathy is to take care of the entire patient and their family because they will it will affect them and in turn it will affect us if the patient comes in and think outside the medical textbooks and be in the real world for every patient. Thank you so much. Over to Professor Darmesh and uh, Dr. Pian Rao finally, and then we close. So no, no, nothing to disclose, and it was very enjoyable as always. Uh, we, we always enjoy listening to Jess and, you know, he's a Molanian and one really takes pride in the fact that he's he's done such seminal work in this area. Good luck to you, Jess. Thank you. Sir Rao. Oh, thank you. I think many, many practical questions have been raised and then they have been answered here, apart from the theoretical aspect about it. I think, Mohan, I think this is going to streamline, this is going to keep it in a YouTube for the people who have who could not because there are so many webinars are going now, you know, so this way, this uh, today, and therefore some of them may not be able to, if you put in a YouTube and then tell them that they can see at any time. Uh, yes, I think yeah. it's been very helpful. Yeah, uh, what, what are we going to do? We have a series of four webinars, you know, the first one was last week. So we'll put up all this on uh, BGM Foundation website and we will give the, provide the link in the YouTube so that people can go there and watch. So we'll connect it to the YouTube. I think if uh, Professor Bajaj agrees, we can put up his slides also on the YouTube, sir. OK, sure. Thank you so much. Thanks yes. a lot. And, uh, over to Vamshi to say the word of thanks before we close. And my hearty thanks to AIG and Nagi also, and uh, also the uh, entire team. Please, please go. It's a privilege to uh, Present word of thanks on behalf of the BGM Foundation and in association with Dr. Nageshwar Reddy, AIG Hospitals. Thanks to all the star words, Dr. Uh, Jess Mohan Bajaj, Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor, Dr. P. N. Rao, and Dr. BGM for taking your precious time on this Sunday and then enlightening all of us. Though each and everyone are far away physically, we could come today digitally. Uh, and this was possible because of our educational partner, Abbott, and our live streaming partner, Imagica Health. Thank you, delegates, for taking time on this Sunday and being with us. Truly, this event is, uh, will not be successful without any of you. We will sign off today, and we'll catch back next week with another interesting session on managing IBS in 2020. Thank you. So please be with us again uh, You know, on another topic, irritable bowel syndrome. Managing management as of 2020. We have international and national speakers, so please be with us. Thank you, viewers, and thanks to Imagica, thanks to AIG and the whole team who put this up. Thanks a lot to all the professors. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good day to Professor Bajaj. So, so thank you, sir. I'm ending the meeting now. Thank you. Thanks, Monique.